Welcome everyone. Um, we are thrilled to have you join us today for the next in our installment of the ACSM Brown Bag in Science series. Um, today we are very excited to have Christine Pellegrini join us as our presenter. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Christine and then we will turn it over to her. We are going to take questions at the end of her presentation. So if you can type your questions into the question box, we will get to those at the end. So let me tell you a little bit about Christine. She did her undergrad at the University of Illinois at Chicago and her master's and doctoral degrees at the University of Pittsburgh. Her doctoral degree is in exercise physiology. And then she also completed postdoctoral work at both um, Northwestern University and at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Christine's very involved with ACSM, also the Society of Behavioral Medicine and the Obesity Society. She is currently an assistant professor in the Technology Center to promote healthy lifestyles and the Department of Exercise Science in the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. Her research focuses on the development and implementation of technology supported behavioral interventions targeting diet, physical activity, sedentary behavior and weight loss. Some of the populations that she's looking at this in include adults with obesity, osteoarthritis, knee replacement, diabetes, and lupus. And today, Christine is gonna share her research um, looking at the use of wearables and technology to encourage healthy behaviors. So at this point, we'll turn it over to Christine. Um, welcome everyone, and again, if you have questions, enter them in the question box, and we will get to them following the presentation. All right, uh, thank you, Lynette. Uh, I'm happy to be here and then to tell you a little bit about my research and, and why I focus uh, on these areas. And I think, oh, let's see now, there we go. Um, Lynette did a great job of just going over my first slide. <laughs> um, so ultimately, the research that I have focused on um, is how can we use technology uh, to kind of support some of our behavioral interventions uh, targeting diet, physical activity, sedentary behavior, um, and ultimately I feel like my goal is typically to promote weight loss or weight management um, in different populations. Uh, so we've used all different uh, different types of technology, especially as it's evolved over the years. I know it originally started uh, with Palm Pilots and I don't even think those exist anymore. Um, but we've used things such as the uh, body media armbands, which also no longer exist, uh, but we've done smartphone applications, uh, different physical activity monitors, text messages, um, and then more recently, the uh, wearables and the, like, the Fitbits. Uh, and I focused on um, populations that have a high prevalence of overweight and obesity. Um, along with overweight and obesity comes a lot of chronic diseases. So uh, diabetes was one um, that I'm interested in, um, especially related to the sedentary behavior. Um, but then we've also focused a lot on populations with different types of disabilities. So I've listed on here, we've done stuff with knee osteoarthritis or knee replacement patients, uh, but I've also done a lot of stuff in individuals with spinal cord injury, uh, lupus, um, and other forms of disability. Uh, so the reason I've gotten into this field is ultimately just saw how big of an issue overweight and obesity is in uh, the U.S. So current estimates suggest almost 70% of adults are overweight or obese. Uh, so obviously that's an uh, enormous issue. Uh, and then these rates are even higher among those um, with disabilities and among minority groups. Um, and so again, it's just populations that need help uh, better managing their weight, um, especially because excess weight increases the risk of chronic diseases. So I've just listed a few off here, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, uh, but I know there's more out there. And looking at the CDC uh, map of diabetes um, across the US, um, it's almost 13% of adults have diabetes. So again, it's a major issue. Um, and then being down in uh, the southern half of the U.S., uh, both obesity and diabetes um, are even um, bigger issues. Um, so always something to work, work towards improving here. Um, and then in addition to chronic diseases, excess weight increases the risk of um, knee osteoarthritis. Uh, and so osteoarthritis is the leading cause of disability in the U.S. today. 
Um, and then just looking specifically at knee osteoarthritis, some of the estimates have suggested that about 45% of the population will eventually develop knee osteoarthritis, um, which is a substantial amount of individuals. Um, and then of those individuals who develop knee osteoarthritis, about half of them will have to go on to have a knee replacement at some point in their life. Um, so again, major issues, um, and potential mobility issues um, to add to the chronic disease burden. Uh, so how do we get to the overweight and obesity issue? Um, you know, obviously there could be other factors, but just focusing kind of in on uh, physical activity and dietary behaviors. Um, looking at our current physical activity behavior, uh, less than 10% of adults are meeting the physical activity guidelines of 150 minutes per week. Um, those with knee osteoarthritis, um, about comparable if not lower um, rates meeting that uh, the uh, physical activity guidelines. Um, and then interestingly, even after those who have knee, knee osteoarthritis, they have the surgery, they have the knee replacement, their pain goes down, they have better function, yet they're still not meeting physical activity guidelines. Um, so again, a major issue as more and more people are going on to have a knee replacement. Um, and then also just looking at the opposite end of the spectrum, um, physical activity is um, not only are we not getting enough moderate to vigorous activity, but we're also spending the majority of our day um, in sedentary behaviors uh, and sitting. Um, so that's a major challenge. And then looking at dietary intake, um, on average, I mean, this was, I think, from a few years ago, so I imagine it's probably even gone up since, um, but we're eating away from home about four times a week, almost two fast food meals per week. Um, again, that's extremely high in calories and fat, which is probably not helping the obesity uh, prevalence by any means. Um, and then we're also uh, not eating as many fruits and vegetables as we should be. So only 13% meeting fruit recommendations uh, and 9% meeting um, recommendations for the vegetable intake. So again, uh, we have lots of work, um, or lots of uh, room for improvement on improving uh, physical activity and dietary behaviors. So then the question is, why have I really focused on the technology? And I think one of the main reasons is just that it's there. Everybody um, is starting to use technology. It's becoming more and more um, prevalent. Looking at smartphones, when they first kind of came out in 2012, 2013, only about 30% of Americans had a smartphone, whereas now in 2018, almost 80% have smartphones. And I'm assuming that this number is only going to continue to increase. Um, I feel like many people couldn't give up their smartphones, so unless there's something new that comes out, um, I think this is just going to continue to go up. And then, interestingly, this number was from uh, a few years ago, but almost 70% of adults are keeping track of one health indicator. So this can be uh, body weight, diet, exercise, um, and this is using some kind of health tracker. And so my assumption is that with the popularity of the wearables and the Fitbits, I'm assuming this number has gone up um, in just the last two years. Um, so again, as the technology is just more prevalent, everyone's using it, you know, kind of how can we take advantage of it? So my thought is, so when we typically go to change diet, physical activity behaviors, we have these behavioral programs uh, they're very intensive. They might involve group sessions, in-person, uh, individual sessions, uh, might promote self-monitoring, goal setting, social support. Uh, we'll be providing feedback. They're just very intensive programs, inexpensive. Uh, so kind of my thought process is that if we can kind of take these programs and somehow we use the technology to deliver uh, these interventions or make some of these other tasks easier and let's see if we can do that especially if it's technologies that people already have so just some of the um studies i just picked a couple uh, of the research studies that i've conducted that appear to have promising results uh, so i just wanted to kind of introduce some of that uh, to you so the first one um was our weight loss program where we had three different groups. Uh, one was just our standard weight loss intervention uh, where they met in person. 
over the six month period of time. Uh, we had another group that we had, they came in for the regular groups, but then we gave them the technology. So we gave them a body media armband, uh, access to the website to track their diet and activity. Um, and then we had one group where we just gave them the technology and we didn't give them um, any type of group support or uh, education. Um, and what we found is that the tech-based programs weren't that much different than our standard programs. And then adding the technology didn't necessarily add all as much as we had thought it might. Um, so kind of the idea that here we are just giving people this technology and they're losing, uh, you know, six to eight percent of their body weight, um, you know, it shows pretty promising. Um, you know, why would we give them a full expensive in-person program in addition to the technology if we could just give them the technology and they could still get a pretty good weight loss out of it. So this and kind of showed me the potential of technology. Uh, unfortunately, like I mentioned before, the body media armbands don't exist anymore, but again, still the idea that the technology um, could help reduce the costs or kind of replace um, some of the uh, in-person programs. Uh, the second study I wanted to highlight was um, our NEAT study. So this was a intervention in which we were trying to reduce sedentary time in adults with diabetes. Um, so at the time we had, um, there's a little picture on there of our uh, shimmer accelerometer. So when we did this, this was the only physical activity monitor that had the capability to wirelessly transmit to a smartphone application. Um, obviously a lot of things have changed since then, uh, but at the time this was the only thing that was available. Um, so what we did is we had participants wear this physical activity monitor around their waist um, and then it would detect 20 minutes of sedentary time. And once that was detected, it would send a message to the smartphone application to prompt the individual to get up um, and move for at least a few minutes. Um, and so what we had um, uh, participants with diabetes, we had them wearing the uh, physical activity monitor and use the app for a month. And we decreased their sedentary time by about 8%. Um, so I thought that was um, pretty promising as well. Uh, and then the third study I just wanted to highlight was some of our more recent um, uh, study. And we were working with knee replacement patients, um, trying to help them uh, better manage their weight. Um, so what we did is we developed a technology intervention um, that was um, developed specifically to address some of the, the barriers and the needs of the knee replacement patients, um, and then the technologies that we used in the intervention included Fitbits and um, text messages. Um, and then we compared programs that started either before patients had the knee replacement, or we had them start at 12 weeks after surgery. So in, our, in the figure, our PACE group was the one who started before surgery, and then our delayed PACE was those who started after surgery. Um, and what we found is that between before surgery to 12 weeks, both groups, regardless of if they were in the weight loss program, was losing weight. And this was just as a mere fact that they had the surgery, they're in extreme pain, they're on painkillers, they have reduced appetite. So even though they really can't move much, um, just they weren't able to be out in the world, probably not eating as many um, fast food um, or going out to restaurants because they just couldn't. Um, and so that seemed promising, I guess, a kind of a free weight loss program uh, tied on to this knee replacement surgery. Uh, but then what we saw is at 12 weeks when we stopped our intervention with our PACE group, their weight loss halted. Whereas in our delayed group, when we started the intervention at 12 weeks, they continued to lose. Um, and so by the end of the intervention at 26, 26 weeks after surgery, um, we had pr produced about an 8% weight loss um, in those patients in the uh, delayed group. Um, so I think this was really interesting um, because it was in an older population. Um, so some of our other studies, um, kind of more middle-aged or younger adults, whereas the, the patients with the knee replacement, it was an older population. Uh, so it was just nice to see that we could use Fitbits, text messages, 
most of them had smartphones, um, were very uh, familiar using websites and um, just overall, it showed that older adults even could be using some of this technology. So now in terms of the kind of the future of our behavioral programs, um, I mean, I think the biggest thing is unless some magic pill is developed, um, I don't think that we're going to be seeing any type of major changes or decreases in the prevalence of overweight and obesity or chronic diseases or even some of the um, osteoarthritis or muscular skeletal issues. Um, and so I think regardless of your position, where you're at, um, even what populations you're working with, I feel like um, everyone is going to be faced either themselves, they're going to know somebody in their family, they're going to work with somebody um, who is experiencing some of these health issues. And so I just feel like they're going to be extremely prevalent for, for anyone regardless of where they're at. Um, and then I think this is true, especially with our aging population. I think the life expectancy to date is about 78 years old. Um, so as people are kind of living longer, there's more opportunities to experience these health issues, um, especially if we can do a better job of maintaining um, independence and physical function. People are going to be out and about more and we're going to um, be running into these individuals as well as ourselves as we continue to age. Um, so I think we're going to continue to need these different behavioral programs um, just helping to um, improve physical activity, improve diet, um, and again, promote better quality of life um, and independence long term. And then in terms of technology, uh, technology use is just only going to go up. I mean, it might not be smartphones in a few years. It's probably going to be some crazy new technology. Um, but as it's still here, we're all going to use it. People that you work with, um, family members, everyone's going to be using it, whether you have a smartphone, you have Fitbits, um, these technologies are going to be available. Uh, and then again, they're going to continue to change. I mean, I feel like even over the last five years, technology has changed drastically. And I always laugh because a lot of the things that we've used in the past, in the past aren't even available anymore. So it's just interesting to think about in five years, what is going to be out there. Uh, so again, we used our shimmer accelerometer, which this was the only monitor that transmitted to the smartphone. Um, and now we're not even using these physical activity monitors anymore. We're just using the smartphones, the internal um, accelerometers and kind of using more novel approaches um, to track behavior, kind of predict behavior. Um, so it's just interesting to see how it's gonna change. Um, and I think with each of these changes and advances and the continued increased use of technology, I think it's just gonna provide more opportunities um, to launch these programs, um, reach some of those harder populations that aren't typically reached. Um, so I think it can only help us in the future. So with that being said, that is all I have, um, but we are always looking for students here in the uh, tech, tech Health Center. Uh, the University of South Carolina, either in the Department of Exercise Science or um, Health Education and Behavior. Uh, so if you're interested in master's, PhD, uh, please let me know. Again, we're always looking for students. And then I am happy to take questions uh, before I hunker down and take uh, shelter from the hurricane. All right, thank you, Christine. That was a great presentation and a really helpful overview of the work that you're doing. We're gonna take some questions at this time and we are gonna start with a question from one of our um, staff members who is here in the, the national office with us. Hi, uh, this is Robin Stewart. I'm wondering if based on your research, um, you are there any commercially available apps that you either have used in your work and or would recommend to people that are working with some of the populations that you've uh, mentioned? Um, that's hard. Um, I feel like I would feel comfortable recommending some of the strategies that are built in on the apps, but I wouldn't necessarily say that any app is better than others. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we face is even when we are using commercially available products and we're trying to test them out, they change constantly. Um, so I feel like we can never truly test whether or not something 
is helpful or not. Um, so I feel like that's that's challenging. All right, we have a couple of questions that have come in from um, folks who are, re are watching remotely. The first one says, the osteoarthritis research study seems to be very promising. However, how were you able to control for factors when the recovery time can differ from person to person? Yeah, that was um, one of the things that we didn't necessarily expect. Um, I mean, we had seen when we started to prepare for this, we did a lot of interviews with patients, um, just trying to figure out how to modify um, our program for this. Um, and ultimately, every individual is so variable in the recovery afterwards. Um, I was shocked even in that, you know, four weeks after surgery, some people would say they have zero pain, whereas somebody else would still have extreme pain, still be using um, some type of assistive device or a walker or a cane. Um, so it was extremely challenging to do that. Uh, but with that sense, we tailored our program specifically to the individual. Um, so while we still gave them the same dietary goal based on their body weight, uh, we were much more flexible with our physical activity recommendations. Um, again, just because some people progress much further um, than others. Uh, but even by 26 weeks after surgery, participants were not engaging in very much physical activity. Um, it's just a knee replacement is a brutal, extremely long uh, recovery process. Um, and so it was uh, just very challenging to get individuals back to trying to increase their physical activity. Uh, so we really, we focused a lot on the, the dietary intake, but again, we had to tailor um, all of our recommendations for activity based on where they were at in their recovery. Great, okay, um, the second part of that question from that person was, um, with your um, sedentary study, did the um, participants know that they would be getting feedback about sitting less? No, we actually did not provide any type of um, feedback to them. We had um, the smartphone application, it asked them, uh, it was basically, to tell us if they were responding to our prompt, even though we could kind of detect that from the physical activity or monitor. Uh, but we were, it was kind of more of a uh, acceptability uh, pilot study where we were trying to figure out is if we prompt you every 20 minutes, is this just gonna be extremely annoying um, or is this gonna be something that you would like? Um, so with each prompt that went off, they were to look at their phone and then check whether or not they were gonna adhere to it uh, whether they were going to ignore it just because they didn't want to do it or if they just could not stand up. So, for example, maybe you're in a work meeting and you wouldn't feel comfortable standing up at that time. Um, and then we also had the ability to extend it. So if the 20 minutes was too quick, would they want to extend it another 15, 20 minutes before uh, they would receive another prompt? So they had that option as well. Great, okay, and another question that's come in, um, one of our viewers is wondering if you've looked at cost effectiveness with any of your remote um, technology studies. No, we have not to date. A lot of them uh, with the technology seems to be um, smaller, more feasibility type studies. Um, however, I am putting in uh, one of my grants, hopefully going in soon, has a um, very large cost effective piece in there. Um, so hopefully we can examine that. But it's, it's challenging with the technology constantly evolving. Of, you know, what can we focus on? Um, so we're trying to focus more on the actual behavior changes rather than what technology that we're using to, to deliver or implement the program. Great. So the next question is, um, could you elaborate on the challenges of using wearables with the oldest people within your samples? <laughs> There's always challenges, even if they're not older. Um, I feel like uh, the specific issues that I feel like were a little bit more um, common with the older adults um, was the type of Fitbit and the class or how you put the wearable on uh, seemed to be more of an issue for older adults. Uh, so some of the, um, I guess the lower end or um, earlier versions of the Fitbits 
um, you had to snap them on, whereas some of the um, higher end ones or even just the way they're kind of transitioning are more like watches. Um, and so the snapping ones, uh, a lot of the older adults had issues with that. Um, but kind of once they broke it in, it seemed to be a little bit easier. Uh, but now if we have the budgets and we can, I always try to go towards uh, the, the monitors that are like um, watches, um, getting just easier for, for uh, participants to put them on. Um, and then I feel like the other issue uh, that we very regularly come across with our older adults, not necessarily our uh, younger uh, participants, is they don't remember their passwords to download apps. Um, so, but I, I don't know what we can necessarily do to help them, but um, I feel like that was usually one of the biggest issues in that we would ask them to find our app um, on the store or, um, and then when they were prompted to enter their password to download it, um, many of them have already forgotten their passwords or have to reach out to um, their children or others or their spouse um, or go home and look at their little cheat sheet that might have their passwords on it. Um, so we always had to kind of account for potential issues or delays in being able to download an app. Okay, here's, an, here's another question from someone who's watching remotely. Does sedentary behavior in your study consider standing? Does it consider heart rate change if an individual is sitting while exercising, um, such as exercise on a sedentary, or I'm sorry, yeah, on a sedentary bike, or uh, you know, an ergometer type bike? Yeah. Um, so our previous technology, um, we had a, a, we didn't test this out, but just from uh, our usability tests, um, it was able to kind of distinguish between sitting and standing. Um, just in the mere fact that we could see the transition when you were looking at the different axes um, on the accelerometer, we could kind of detect that transition from sitting to standing. Um, but again, I don't know if that would necessarily be possible in some of our older adults who might transition more slowly going from uh, sitting to standing, so that might not be as possible. Um, but then we also see that when somebody's standing, most likely they're not standing, they're completely still, they're kind of shifting their weight from one side to another. Um, so we would be able to see um, that motion. Um, in our current app that we are um, testing out, we're using kind of more of the approach that um, we're basing the assumption that most people are carrying their phones with them or have them within an arm's reach at most of the day. Um, so we're not actually trying to figure out what they're doing, um, but more just kind of detecting whether or not there's motion or not motion, uh, which would be um, a sign of if somebody's sitting uh, versus standing or moving around, there might be a little bit more action. But in terms of um, you know, cases where I know that this absolutely does not work is um, a standing desk, uh, for example. Uh, so I have a standing desk and testing the app out I have my phone near me all the time, but when I use my standing desk, it doesn't know that I'm standing. Um, but I'm guessing that the majority of the population um, does not have a standing desk, um, so that wouldn't be um, necessarily of concern yet. But I think at least our ideas are that we're going to be trying to target those who are the most sedentary, um, and it would potentially be helpful or beneficial for them. Okay, so a next question is, um, have you found that certain types of technology, such as text messages or certain apps, are more effective than others in promoting physical activity in minority populations? Um, my research, I mean, we've definitely had some studies that have had probably 50% minority populations. Um, however, we haven't um, done extensive analyses or looked at differences in that in those groups um, or compared minority to non-minority uh, populations and I'm also not familiar um, with any research that suggests that um, so I I am not aware of anything suggesting what might be better for um, um, populations or minority populations um, I guess my think initial thought is that similar to any other population, 
um, it's going to be very specific to the individual. So I feel like any way that you can tailor your options or programs um, so that they're flexible and could accommodate different preferences or issues, I think that would be um, the best route to go. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from one of our staff members. Hi, this is Gretchen Patch. Um, I was curious if you had done any um, long-term follow-ups to see if um, increases in activity or decreases in weight status um, were maintained um, longer than just the original study periods. Um, for our knee replacement um, study, we did have a um, just a self-report uh, follow-up with the participants all the way to a year. Um, and we did find that the group that started 12 weeks after um, continued to be a little bit more physically active than those who started before surgery. Um, they had trends for better function, reduced pain, um, and they also maintained um, the greatest weight loss over that time period. So it seems very promising. All right, our next question is, what are your thoughts on automatic feedback versus counselor-led feedback in technology-based interventions for weight loss? Um, I mean, I think the automatic feedback is great because um, you know, just going from providing so much feedback to participants and all of these interventions, um, it's extremely time-consuming um, and costly, especially when you're paying for staff, students, or others to provide uh, the feedback to participants. So I feel like, you know, automation could be a great thing. However, I also know that, you know, if the participants can tell that it's automated, you know, they might, if they might not find it as helpful and potentially ignore it if it doesn't have that same uh, personalization um, that a human being um, would have. However, technology is also advancing. So I think, um, you know, with, with more machine learning, more algorithms, you know, creating these, you know, highly tailored um, automated feedback programs could be possible. I feel like just the ones that we've used are, um, you know, I think they work for a short period of time, um, but I don't know how long they would or, you know, if, if participants truly find them helpful. Great, okay. This question is um, about something you presented in your um, slides earlier. The person is asking for clarification. How was the delayed pace group different from the regular pace group? And why did the regular pace group stop activity after the 12 weeks? So the only difference between the two groups is that the, the pace group started the weight loss program before they went into surgery. So it was up to six weeks before they had surgery, they started the weight loss program. Uh, whereas our delayed group, we didn't start any type of intervention or have any contact with them until 12 weeks after um, surgery. Um, and so why they stopped being more physically active, I wouldn't say they necessarily stopped being more active, um, but I think the one of the challenges with the knee replacement population um, is that nobody wants to go in to have knee replacement um, at a younger age, just because the life of the implant is not forever. Um, and so as more and more people are overweight, there's more wear and tear on the knee, um, people uh, are being potentially offered knee replacements, uh, but they're also trying to delay them as long as possible. So they're going um, you know, several years sometimes with extreme knee pain, trying all different alternatives. Um, and so at the point before they have the knee replacement, it's potentially five years after they've had major knee pain and maybe have stopped being physically active. Um, so then even when they have the knee replacement, they no longer have the knee pain, they have better function. Um, it's been over five years since they've been active. So I think that they're just so out of the routine, uh, it becomes extremely difficult to suddenly develop a new habit. Um, because I feel like they just don't know what their normal is anymore. Um, and so while we, we saw um, the participants started to slightly increase their activity after the surgery, um, it was not any higher than their baseline activity. 
All right. So this um, person says, I am a wellness coach and work with clients in person for a national company. Have you explored any research with digital or online coaching? Um, some of the stuff that we have um, done have, um, I'm trying to think of the ones that we've done, the ones I presented. Um, some of them have had opportunities to connect via, uh, through the app or through email or virtually. Um, but I think some people have used them, but I wouldn't necessarily say that anybody has, I guess, determined that if that's more beneficial or if that could replace the more in-person um, contact. And I'm not familiar with any studies that have directly compared those. Um, but again, we've kind of used some minor approaches of that in some of our um, studies, but again, nothing where it's been a primary focus or that we can make some definitive conclusions off of. Okay, um, this is another question from someone watching remotely. Do you feel that a heart rate monitor in combination with the accelerometer would have provided you with important additional information? Um, I feel like it would have potentially, um, but I feel like heart rate is so variable, um, especially if anybody is on any type of medication. Um, that I don't know how helpful that would be. Um, I guess it depends on your purpose or your ultimate outcome that you are um, or behavior you're trying to change. Um, I know for my situations or any of the things that I've looked at, heart rate wouldn't necessarily be extremely helpful. Um, the only case that I could see it being helpful in um, is with um, using the Fitbits and if we were trying to determine how we'll long participants are wearing the heart rate. Sometimes Fitbit kind of just fills in data or fills in um, information. And so it's not as clear as something like an actigraph where there's um, valid algorithms and, and calculations you can do to determine where from non-wear time. Uh, with the Fitbit, there's not necessarily that yet, but if there is a heart rate, obviously that means somebody's wearing it. And then if there's not a heart rate, then it's not. Um, so again, I think it, it's all dependent on what you were truly interested in. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, one thing that I'm curious about, um, if you could speak just to a little bit about the ethical considerations about this type of data. Um, do you, Are there any special IRB considerations that you have to go through um, if you're gonna do this type of research work? I mean, who owns the data? Does the Fitbit monitor own the data? Do you own the data? Does your university own the data? Does the patient or the participant? So maybe just speak to that if you can. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's been challenging. And I feel like um, in terms of IRBs, I feel like it's institution um, specific, um, where some institutions might um, uh, require a little bit more um, information. Um, so for example, in previous um, consent forms, we've had to include very specific information of um, if you're using a Fitbit, you have to download the Fitbit app and the Fitbit app is going to ask for your email address um, and your IP address or it's going to be able to know that it's your phone, um, whereas other um, IRBs are a little bit more lenient in that they can just say, you'll have to download the Fitbit app, but we won't have to go through all of the um, very specifics of what it means when you're downloading a commercially available app. Um, and then typically if we are collecting um, data, so for example, Fitbit, uh, Fitbit has an open API, uh, so programmers um, can go in and kind of build um, websites or apps or programs that can kind of pull participants' Fitbit data um, there's also commercially available things like uh, Fitabase that can do the same thing. Um, so the only problem with that, or I wouldn't say it's a problem, but you have to have the participant's approval to get that information. So it's not like you can just kind of secretly um, you know, use the API and start pulling random people's information. That user has to go in and approve um, access to that information, and then they can very explicitly say, um, what information you can access, so whether that's being weight or physical activity or your friend or or what they, but they can again indicate what they'll share with you. Uh, but I have found that it's uh, very institutional specific on 
what the different requirements are. Okay, if you're a um, health and fitness professional working with clients, do you feel like these technology study findings are sort of robust enough that, let's say your personal trainer, would you consider recommending to a client that they invest money in purchasing some sort of technology, or do you think the um, research is too early um, to make that sort of determination? I mean, I would definitely lean towards that the research is not there yet. Um, I, I Today I showed you the promising results, uh, but there are also many studies that we've done where the results were not um, in favor of using the technology. So for example, we did one weight loss program where we had some using um, paper, and then we had others who used a smartphone application uh, and a physical activity monitor, and we found that those who were just using paper lost more weight than those who had all of the fancy technology. Um, so obviously there could be a lot of other factors going on and older technology, um, but again, you know, that those results were not in, in favor of the technology. So I feel like it's very specific on what you think you want your clients to be doing. And if they're doing absolutely nothing, you know, maybe a Fitbit or something could be helpful um, but then, you know, from the other standpoint, I'm kind of at the mindset where I think Fitbits focus too much on steps. And so I think people aren't necessarily trying to exercise anymore because they're just trying to get steps. Um, but we know that there's evidence that engaging in moderate to vigorous activity is helpful. Um, so, but some people are also different than others. So I feel like it's very, um, dependent on who you think that individual is, what would help motivate them, um, what's the end goal. Um, if it's just a source of frustration, they're not very um, good with technology, then I definitely wouldn't recommend it. But maybe if they are, I, I mean, it could have potential, but I feel like there's not enough evidence out there um, to fully say one way or another. Great, we're gonna take two more questions and our first one is gonna be from one of our ACSM staff. Hi, this is Robin Stewart again. So I'm gonna go back to my first question. I understand you feel reluctant to recommend specific commercial apps, but if a physician has a patient in his or her office mm -hmm. who cannot afford to go to a fitness facility and you would like to recommend, encourage them to find an app that would help them become more active, what features of the app or you know what kind of feedback have you found are most helpful in helping someone be more physically active or less sedentary or a combination of the two i mean i feel like the biggest one i would probably promote is just the self-tracking or the self-monitoring um, of the activity i mean similar to diet we know that those who track their diet more frequently are um are better at weight loss or weight management um, and so I think for physical activity, I could be, see that being the same. Um, but again, I think there's also just big confusions in, in terms of um, active self-monitoring where you're actually writing something down. Like I just went for a walk for 10 minutes versus wearing a Fitbit and it out automatically doing um, itself. Um, so I think there's differences in there, but I feel like self-monitoring um, and goal setting would probably be the uh, top two uh, strategies or features that I would look for in an app. Great. And our final question is, if you are um, working in this space, you're interested in doing research using technology for behavior change, are there um, grant funding or foundation uh, research opportunities that you would recommend? I guess basically are there certain places you would recommend folks look for funding if they're doing or wanting to do research in this area? Um, no, I feel like there's not any one opportunity that would be better than another. I feel like there's a lot of um, foundational, even ACSM has some grant mechanisms um, that I'm assuming would be appropriate uh, for any type of technology-based work. Um, NIH, I know, is funding a lot of um, tech-based um, studies, so I think that um, and there's probably a lot of options. It's probably just looking for that best fit for whatever you're trying to um, specifically examine in your study. But I think there's a lot of outlets. 
So basically wherever you're not applying for funding, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I can tell you which cycles, what mechanisms, and then when not to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, we couldn't resist. <laughs> All right, with that, we're going to wrap up. We want to remind everyone that on the screen um, in the upper left corner is Christine's contact information. She welcomes those of you that have questions about the University of South Carolina's graduate programs or the um, Tech Health Center in general. So her contact information is there. Um, really thank you for your time today, Christine. This has been really interesting. Um, and with that, the ACSM staff are going to end with a big round of applause for Christine. And we'll say goodbye to the rest of you. All right, thanks. Bye.